let me start by, by making some short, in, short introductions to, to our fantastic panel here. Um, maybe I will start with, with Victor. Uh, Victor is a senior applied scientist at, at, at Zero, where he's been working in uh, machine learning products division for the past 18 months. His prior experiences include a PhD, right, in maths from the University of Oxford, quantitative research in a London hedge fund, computational modeling of Alzheimer's disease at the University of Melbourne. So a great, great set of experiences. Then we have got Damien right here next to me. So um, Damien actually comes from Astral, and I know we have got Lufan and Papa here, right? Who are actually, it's a Cyrus industry partner and they are working with Cyrus. So Damien works as a um, enterprise information management consultant at Astral Consulting Services. Um, Astral has been a leader in enterprise content management and business process management space for the past 10 years. And Damien brings uh, 15 years of experience in the delivery of information management solutions across a variety of industries. And next we have got Carl, and uh, Carl is also from, from Zero, uh, working in the AI product division. And uh, so, so Zero, for those of you who don't know, is an accounting software company founded in New Zealand in 2007. Uh, Carl is an um, alumnus of the University of Melbourne, also obtained his PhD in computer science in 2012, transitioned to various data science roles in industry after a, sh a short stint as a postdoc in academia. And over the last 10 years, Carl has worked in large corporations, smaller startups, gaining lots of experience to global scale data infrastructure, software engineering practices, cloud computing, uh, and many, many ways of doing science in industry, okay. And um, we have got Fernando. Uh, Fernando is a principal, a responsible AI leader in, in Seek Limited, you know, where we all go looking for jobs. Um, Fernando is a former computer science professor, so a, a former academic and data scientist, really passionate about solving problems. Um, over a decade of experience in ML and recommender systems, extensive contributions to industry and academia. Uh, recently, he has dedicated himself to learning and contributing to the exciting challenge of operationalizing uh, RAI in the industry and focusing on bridging the gap between conceptual and technical perspectives. I'm gonna loop back to that, Fernando, that's really intriguing. And last but not least, we have got uh, Ming Fang Wu, uh, who is a senior research data specialist at the Australian Data uh, Australian Research Data Commons, or ARDC. Many of us who are in the Australian academia, we know about the, uh, this organization. Um, Ming Fang is working as a product manager at ARDC. She's a practitioner and researcher in data discovery space and is a member of the Research Data Alliance Technical Advisory Board. Uh, among Ming Feng's research interests are interactive information retrieval. Uh, you just had a big workshop on information retrieval and chat GPT, so you know about that. Data discovery, search log analysis, and natural language uh, processing. So welcome, everybody. So I have a question uh, for, for, for everyone, and we might just go around. Uh, we are in the midst of a uh, big change in terms of the technology that we are seeing coming forth, not just um, you know, the, the impact of that technology, but the speed with which it is coming to us, right? Very fast changing, constantly new technologies and advancements. So, so tell us, um, in your work, what sort of excitement, but also challenges, these fast cycles, you know, these fast cycles um, are, are posing to you and for the products uh, that, you are, uh, that you are developing. So I want to talk about these fast cycles, you know, in contrast to research, which typically has long duration, right? Um, all right, so perhaps I start with Victor. Sure. So the big one straight away to kick things off. Um, I think 
When you talk about fast cycles and extremely expedient development, you refer to the LLMs and generative AI and things like this, right? So it's only now started to trickle down into industry as far as we know it. So it's too early to tell you the full story, I guess. But generally, uh, so my impression of the whole thing is if you go on Twitter, something formerly known as Twitter, now X, you'll find two camps of people, right? So people who think that it's all nonsense and it's going nowhere and uh, it's just a fad, it will fade away and will return to the good old world. And another camp of people who think that AGI is around the corner, it's going to solve all problems, it's going to be brilliant. So the truth likely is somewhere in between. Um, in terms of zero specifically, um, in the world of accounting, there is a bit of existential dread. So people hear those things and they're not experts in the field, so they feel like they're going to be replaced tomorrow. You know, All of a sudden, AGI will come and take their jobs and they will be entirely obsolete. And that's likely not true either, because uh, you always need domain expertise. In terms of fast development cycle, uh, I think Carl will talk more about it because I think he has a little bit more experience, but uh, in this particular domain of LLMs applied to uh, you know, scientific investigation industry. But um, they do provide an extremely competent out-of-the-box information retrieval agency, kind of, you know, engine, sorry. Uh, and kind of you cannot underestimate what they're capable of doing. The context in which they apply it very often are somewhat strange because you can't really solve hallucination entirely. And so if your context uh, requires 100% fidelity, maybe that's not the right tool for the job. But if you want you know, something where some modicum of hallucination is allowed, that's fantastic. And I think with that, I'll pass on to someone else so as not to give a lecture. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Indeed, yes, there is a, there is a lead to balance. Um, Fernando, what are your thoughts? Well, I could say, from the responsible AI perspective, as you mentioned, that are a lot of complexity, challenges, opportunities as well, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I personally believe that a good starting point and an opportunity that responsible AI actually brings to us is truly understand what the kind of impact we're bringing, right? It's a really social technological view other than simply a system view on that and technological view. Uh, in isolation that, and it brings to many of the, the points that uh, Carl mentioned here. And I feel like, he, uh, for me, in terms of opportun uh, of challenge, let's start by that. It starts, in my opinion, by what you're doing here, right? We have a huge educational gap in terms of truly understand uh, what this new type of technology brings in terms of impact. I could say by myself, right, because I have a PhD in computer science, master, etc. I spent decades of my life uh, understanding how to be uh, smarter, uh, optimal, with uh, high accuracy, high coverage. But ask me how many times of my undergrad, master, and PhD I spent uh, understanding how to be fair, transparent, reliable, compliant. Zero hours. <laughs> and most of the people working in the industry, uh, just like me, my generation, has this lack of understanding on that. And many of you are doing a really good job on trying to fill this gap and making, uh, bringing this understand. And on the industry part, and, and be getting back to the cycle here, where I bring the challenge is how to make it proportionate and efficient and truly integrated to this kind of life, life cycle development. It is not enough to be well intentioned and good, right? but it's important to be effective. Otherwise, the kind of impact we, we still generate are, are exactly the same we have right now and not the best. So I feel like in terms of opportunities is learning how to embed human values in a really tangible and effective way in order to make us having control of everything and also uh, develop and innovate faster and with more confidence of that. Food for thought. Thank you, Fernando. Think so. um, and as uh, Sh <clears throat> Shazia said, I'm working for Australia Research Data Commons. So we tackle that problem by accelerating research and innovation um, by providing the um, the uh, leading research infrastructure. So uh, we can um, accelerate, accelerate the 
uh, uh, creation analysis and retention of high quality data sets. So when we're doing research, each of the individuals set up our workflows and, and uh, access data, spend lots of time on data randomly, um, but only a small percent of that your time probably uh, on data analysis and modeling. Um, so we try to expand that process, providing high quality data set so you don't need to spend much more time to clean data and uh, provide uh, um, the data computing environment uh, and also collaborative environment. Uh, nowadays, many research is not the individual discipline, it's multi-disciplines. So we trying to provide that kind of data and a computing environment to bring people together to address that uh, uh, complex research questions and also make use of the latest technology to, to compact the, um, those questions matters to our society and uh, our daily life. Yeah, thank, thank you. Ling Feng. I mean, ARDC plays a really instrumental role in supporting research in Australia by providing those, you know, data sets, curated data sets, benchmark data sets, as well as the infrastructure, right? And, and, uh, and yeah, um, yeah, Cyrus students would have heard me say way too many times, but <laughs> maybe others haven't, is that, you know, we know that 80% of the time uh, for data scientists is really spent on those tedious tasks of, uh, of cleaning, filtering, transforming, curating, annotating, and all of that work that goes into data preparation. You know, another commonly used phrase is, everybody wants to do the model work and nobody wants to do the data work. Uh, but I think what we want to really convey in this PhD school is the importance of handling your data with care. You know, you, you, you saw many presentations today, including the keynote, uh, which talked about the opaque models, right? So-called black box models. You don't know what's going inside it. So your import data sets are really going to govern a lot of the um, a lot of the transparency or, or devising or the important, you know, confidence in your decision making. And, and indeed, the work that Ming Feng and her team and ARDC does is, is really important from that point of view. Thank you, Ming Feng. Cut. Um, yeah, I guess on the, um, the topic of sort of, you know, modern enhancements in AI um, as, a, as an accelerator towards development, I guess it's one approach that is good to keep in mind whenever there's a you know an explosive new um, uh, piece of kit that everyone wants to get their hands on is to consider it you know it is fundamentally um, another arrow to add to your quiver um, so it's valuable to think about these new evolutions whether they be in ai be in data analytics or data processing um, fundamentally, they're all building blocks, um, and what you're trying to solve is a problem. Um, and what you, as PhD students, are contributing to that problem is critical thought, ultimately. Um, if these new whiz-bang models that are coming out that are promising the world are able to somehow get towards that solution, then they're worth investigating. Um, but um, to, I guess, to uh, Fernando's point, around, you know, it is very important you analyze these things critically to make sure that they, one, solve the problem and two, do not cause harm. Um, that is a fundamental thing that you should be considering at all stages, even with things that have existed for 20, 30 years. Um, there are still, you know, cases where information retrieval, um, a poor relevance metric can cause harm in certain situations. And it's important to know when, um, yeah, it is appropriate or not appropriate to proceed with those. Indeed. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, very important point. Damien. So I think both to Carl and Victor's point, uh, the 100% certainty is what's holding up AI uh, in industry, for sure. Um, a lot of our customers are oil and gas, mining, um, utilities, and um, where information management comes into it is giving the end user 100% certainty that the information they're getting is, is the correct information. And a lot of the, the work we do within organizations will be driven 
based on deaths. Yeah, and I know that sounds bad, but effectively the business case is driven for them to spend a lot of money on information management because somebody has died because they've had the wrong information. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, we get at the moment a lot of CIOs come into us excited. They want to do something with the technology. Um, they spend money on it. They're going to all these different vendors who have got integrations into their product and they're saying, we do GIA. It's, uh, I think um, the point being is that they can't find a business benefit for it yet. Um, it's great. It might save a couple of guys an extra two hours. They can go to the pub early and uh, you know, not do as much work as they used to to uh, um, summarise their work. But we're struggling at the moment to find those business benefits. I think they're there, but it's just about how, how we find them and uh, integrate them. It's going to be all about integrating into existing processes, existing solutions, yeah? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for making that point, bit of a reality check there. And Damien, I might just continue with you, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the business case, I think you made a very effective point, but I, I'm just thinking from the perceptions of business leaders uh, trust and reliability. You know, some of the research that I came across is that, um, you know, sometimes we don't trust, but we still rely on it. And maybe it goes back to Victor's point about, you know, tolerance levels of hallucinations or inaccuracies, right? So, um, you know, you've got a, uh, so Astral has got a long history of working with, you know, more traditional and tested tools and techniques. Um, what is your, well, you know, what have you observed in terms of business leaders' trust and reliability concerns? Or excitement. Or excitement. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> trust and reliability, excitement. I think um, the sad thing is, is, is it's probably greater than it should be. Um, I think a lot of uh, organisations take a pretty serious incident to, to take it seriously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think um, you know, the, the level of investment historically, and I think Luthan, your, your research project is showing all the issues that were there 20 years ago are still there today, yeah? And there's, there's a lot of money spent on it, but not necessarily the outcomes due to you know, lack of governance, um, et cetera. I think AI has got a, a, a place or a role um, in aiding um, this, uh, this space, um, but uh, you know, you're always going to need that human, human interaction, I believe, yeah. Mm. Indeed, indeed. Uh, no, that's a, that's a point well made. Thank you. Thank you, Damien. I might uh, uh, go to Carl and Victor, and in any order. Um, you know, accounting, as you said, one of the oldest professions, yes, in the world. Um, and if, if, you know, if I'm not mistaken, precision is of utmost importance, right, in accounting. So maybe share uh, some experiences from your work, you know, in, at zero, um, in your product, uh, product innovation, product development, machine learning or AI, and the role of uh, good responsible data management there because a lot of students over here are, are coming to this PhD school, you know, particularly focused on data management. Uh, some examples would be great. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, one aspect which I've been very impressed with coming to zero is the, I guess, the level of responsibility we, we place around responsible data management and data use. Um, there's a level of uh, I guess weight that we apply to any decisions made with customer data, because fundamentally we are dealing with very personal information um, about people, about businesses that has a, a fundamental effect on their livelihood. And there is a responsibility there that, you know, if you, um, you know, from the, the product perspective, if you develop a, a poor classifier um, or a poor forecaster, you are going to cause harm. You are going to affect people's livelihoods. And that is a case where you need to be very responsible about any changes you make within that workflow. But it also goes to how you treat their data when you are not developing it as part of a product. How do you retain it? How do you make sure that it is secure? Um, how do you make sure that you are GDPR compliant? Um, there are a lot of ways that you need to be, need to ensure that, um, that you, you apply that responsibility whenever a decision is made surrounding that data. Um, and at zero, we try to do that. 
Um, and you know, uh, it's the case we have a lot of layers of um, assessment around if you are going to develop a new product, you need to justify why that product is valuable, um, why that product will not cause harm, why that product um, is, needs to access the data to the classification level that it needs to access it. It's very much a, not a process of, oh yeah, no, I can just ship that. It's a, you know, a thing that I wanna try out. There's a lot of steps we go through um, to ensure that you know, we, are, we make sure that any access to data that is privileged or confidential or sensitive um, goes through the right checks and balances first. Yeah, very good. And thank you for mentioning, you know, compliance. I mean, that's a, that's a huge um, aspect in financial reporting. Um, and yeah, good that to be thinking about that. Absolutely. Um, There's not much to add, really, to what Carl said. Um, indeed, like a lot of governance and compliance are kind of well, stipulated by law almost, you know, as a, as a company dealing with, you know, personalized data, it's your financial data, your all sorts of other things, like you really have to be GBTH. I can never pronounce the particular acronym, compliant. Um, yeah, so in that sense, not much to add. Um, in terms of fair models, I guess it affects zero a little bit less than maybe some other places. Because um, if by fairness we understand things like, you know, um, I want to be invariant with respect to a particular set of attributes, you know, gender, you know, race, things like this. That's not really a concern for zero, given the products we currently have, um, but simply because, you know, it's just not the nature of the products. But should kind of that particular need to be fair emerge, I'm sure a company like Zero would take it quite seriously, I would say, given what I've seen as well. But yeah. yeah indeed, indeed. Um, yeah, there's, uh, this morning we had a keynote, and uh, if you remember, you know, Jenny had a slide where she had a, a, a shot, but, but pretty impressive taxonomy of different kind of, of biases. And obviously, you know, not every, every situation applies in every context, uh, but just the awareness that it can be there is, is really important. So, yeah, good point um, there, Victor. Um, Fernando. So coming back to your recent work on bridging conceptual and technical perspectives, you know, for research students and also for early career researchers, well, even for old props like myself, that gap is pretty challenging, you know, from, from academic outcomes, you know, published in the best places to actually having that, you know, leap into the technology transfer, sort of the technical perspective. Um, so share, uh, share some of your, your experiences and your thoughts in, in bridging that gap. Yeah, yeah I totally agree with you. Uh, I, I do believe that one of the first and biggest challenge, uh, it is exactly uh, fill this gap. And to some extent, it starts actually by clarifying to people what exactly is responsible AI, right? Res being responsible. So if I get back to you so, and ask, are you a responsible professor? Are you a responsible citizen? It's so vague to say, right? <laughs> so it's basically uh, the challenge, in my opinion, starts from that, right? Uh, I see res uh, someone told me once that actually responsible AI is an organizational behavior and is actually a concept in construction, right? We need to understand what it means for us in order to, to start by being committed to that and comply to that, right? So a first uh, challenge then is starting to make it clear in a really concrete way, especially to uh, stakeholders and leaders in the industry, what do we mean? What we want as an organization? At the end of the day, uh, the ethical decision is not the most difficult. The most one is what we want as an organization. And that's a start from it. And, and the second moment, I feel like industry and academy is collaborating to, uh, to move faster on that, is moving from principles to practice. I do believe we see a lot of progress on that. However, I'm calling for what I, I say that moving from practices to requirements, right? Most of the practices we so far observe in the literature are most, in my opinion, in a management level. So when I get back to a technical team, data scientists, and say, hey, you need to be fair. They ask me what I need to do, how I get that. It is not most about why and what, but how. And in order to be very clear to them, I need to get with clear system level requirements, right? Metrics or specific 
uh, uh, KPIs, etc., that make it easy to people understand and mostly measure that, right? We need to be able to verify what we're claiming to be. So if you're claiming to be responsible, we need to somehow uh, have m ways to measure that, right? For example, I claim that I'm black. I'm just saying that because I have a way to, to prove that somehow, right? That's the same in, in, in the uh, responsible way. And I feel like uh, we trying to move in this direction and, and I feel that academy can contribute a lot on filling this gap, especially bringing up more system level requirements on this. Okay. Yeah, again, very thought provoking. I mean, I remember uh, the words of Edward Deming, you know, he's sort of the father of the quality profession that you cannot manage what you cannot measure. Uh, but when you, we talk about phenomena or concepts such as responsibility, the measurement is not that straightforward, right? And especially when it comes to something that ties in with human behavior, I mean, that measurement is super hard, right? Uh, but indeed, uh, I take your point. I think we have, um, we have many frameworks around responsible data science and now responsible and safe AI, you know, um, uh, the European Union has got one, um, so, so CSIRO and the National AI Center over here also has got a framework on ethical, responsible, safe AI. But your point about, okay, how do you operationalize it, right? The principles are great. If nobody is going to challenge them, but how do you operationalize it? That is indeed a challenge. Yeah, <laughs> very well said. Um, main thing. Um, now, from a research data perspective, uh, you know, many, many students, if not everybody here, are working in data-heavy disciplines. What advice do you have for our future researchers in terms of their data management perspectives? I'm asking that question because you must have seen, you know, cases where, you know, researchers have come in uh, with some either, uh, you know, good toolkits or good skills, uh, and they have managed to get their scientific workflows established, accelerated, and, and, and others may have struggled, right? Um, so yeah, share some of your, your, your advice with us. Um, yeah, so in the research area, so um, we are most supportive. The most important thing is the reproducibility of your research. That's need a, a good research and data management. So when you plug in data and run your model, get the data out of published paper, can other people reproduce your research and build what you are doing and do further research. So um, from the beginning, um, I, I, I think, you know, you have university, whatever you come, university you come from, they might have a data management guide there. If not, you can ask your research office or your supervisor or library. So basically, um, so you need to keep a good record of provenance, where the data you get come from, and then what model, what is the parameter you set up to run that data, and then what can also include computing environment, you know, recording that process, and uh, you can keep that, publish that record uh, in your uh, university's data repository or public available. When you publish your data, you can, uh, in your um, research paper, reference back to that uh, data management record or data province record. Then, in the future, you not only benefit others to build work on your research, but also three years back, you want to revisit your research, you don't, have, <laughs> you don't know where the data is, what is the process you follow. You couldn't even reproduce your research yourself. So we heard many of those uh, um, kind of stories, you know. Uh, today, we probably are more convenient. We store our data, run our program on, you know, on Google Drive or code. 
um, Google Code, uh, what is that called, <laughs> you know. Um, but still, you know, um, three years later, which directory you go to access the data, what is the clean process you involved, you may forgot. So, um, yes, so um, good data management skill is good to um, develop um, from your research, from your PhD project. And also, uh, this could be a career path into the future. So, um, you, you, you will see there are many jobs coming out from government uh, agencies from private sectors. Uh, so basically, uh, those government or research sectors, they have a good data governance structure there, but need someone go to implement that. So that data management skills is crucial uh, for that. So um, that's um, different career paths from research, probably, but interesting one to follow. <laughs> Uh, it's in high demand nowadays. We couldn't find a good data management person. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, you know the, the the question of repeatability is is now very um, you know well established at least in the computer science. So those of you who publish in the computer science research community, yeah, any of the top conferences. If you if your code is if your experiment is not repeatable, it's unlikely you'll get the paper in, right? So whether you put it on GitHub or whatever form, you make it available to the reviewers to actually reproduce your results. That is a given. Um, and so so if you are publishing in, in in other areas where maybe this is not so closely uh, closely stipulated, uh, then I think Ming Feng's advice is to. You know, make sure you have the documentation. I know it's a pain, it's a chore, you have deadlines. Make sure you have the documentation to, to actually have that repeatability element, you know, if not for anyone else, for yourself three years later, right? Uh, and, uh, and that is just good practice. Um, you at the, at the Cyrus Center, you know, because all of our PhD students are actually deeply immersed in data research, right? So we do have a data governance um, a data governance uh, workshop that we've got an industry uh, person who comes in from an information security background and ex-IBM uh, who runs this workshop, you know, periodically and, and Kate and Marta have implemented a whole system of data governance forms and everything, what data you're using, what are you going to use it for and so on. And it's not so much about policing it. But but it is more about training the students. So 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 Cyrus students, you know, if you, are, you keep wondering why do I have to fill in all these extra forms, that's the data governance part. Okay, hope that Ming Feng has has sold it to you. All right, thank you so much for your responses so far. I want to uh, open it up to our students now uh, for for questions, uh, you know, comments. Uh, feedback uh, to, to our panel members. Make use of this uh, great opportunity. Since I'm helping uh, distribute this mic, I take advantage to ask the first question, may I? <laughs> Go for it. Uh, can I ask a question, direct this question to uh, Dr. Fernando from SIG? And because anyone from us, if anyone is interested in looking at their career in the industry, uh, seek.com may be the first stop to visit. <laughs> so my question is, what drives your organization to seek out, I mean, uh, PhD, uh, PhD for employment? And I'm interested in hearing any instances uh, for example, what type of the business problems uh, a PhD graduate might tackle in your organization and or what skills you may be looking for? Yeah, I'm asking for a friend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the questions, really uh, important one for this audience, right? So actually, SEEK currently have around, it's a big team of data scientists, engineers, around 200 people, uh, not just in Australia, New Zealand and countries of Asia. 
and we, we indeed value a lot people from uh, academia, like myself. Uh, I used to be a data scientist before becoming a responsible AI here. And I feel like we seek, seek developers in, uh, internally. We have in-house solutions for most of these uh, AI products. So many of our products already has AI and we develop most of the solutions internally. We've been using, for example, LLMs for, for a while. Uh, we search internally. So what happens is like uh, in most of our teams, we have indeed uh, PhDs and masters. We actually value a lot of that because mostly because of the capability we acquire on solving problems, right? I like to say that uh, we as researchers are good not to provide in the solutions but to point out the, the right questions and indeed we value a lot that in the product development ideation process. So what happened is like uh, many of my, our colleagues, senior uh, data scientists there are PhD like myself, uh, actually from the same institution like uh, I, I, I from Brazil, I am from Brazil. And we also uh, sometimes engage with universities and, and you know, research institutes in very focused research programs in order to solve, uh, get additional perspective on, on specific problems in recruitment. As you could imagine, fairness and all of this is really important for us, ensuring that we're not introducing, not amplifying any kind of discrimination. And sometimes we're trying to engage with experts like you, like many universities, CSIRO, and many other institutes that we're trying to get closer and hear of. That's an important thing for us. Very good question, Daisy. And indeed, you know, in terms of um, research industry collaborations, uh, Australia can do better. Uh, you know, we, we have some models, uh, but, but if I compare with other places, you know, like I just think West Coast, uh, US, um, we don't have that skill uh, at all. So, so whether it is talent acquisition, so PhDs coming and working for industry, very good pathway. Uh, it could be, you know, a specialist form of a sponsored research, you know, where there's one expert in the country for a specific thing and industry wants that done, you know, why not go to the expert in the country that can provide that. Uh, but my favorite, of course, is partnerships, right? When we partner, I think we can do a lot more. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. More questions? Thank you for such a nice discussion. So my question is a bit in general. So what I see here in academia in general these days is that everything, like for example, we have people from different fields and a lot of them are basically working on the field of artificial intelligence. They are trying to develop models and so on. Now what I see is that the other areas of computer science, for example, like computer systems, algorithms, networking, and uh, you know the other parts of computer systems, the, the basics, that is somehow taking a backstage nowadays from my uh, observation and most of the people are you know trying to be uh, get towards artificial intelligence machine learning and so on so I want to see from the pan, uh, from the industry perspective if let's say there's a uh, the, uh, what percentage of jobs or what percentage of work actually is attributed to artificial intelligence and machine learning and what percentage of work is dedicated back to the original computer science before the machine learning era it still exists today very good question damien can i ask you for a reality check again yeah <laughs> uh well if you, if you look at the engagements we have in our customers it's probably about 99 percent other one percent ai yeah um they want to do a lot more but it's about finding the, the money and the business benefits to do it um <laughs> I think if you look at what we're doing in AI, the most interesting one has been driven around PII, personal identifiable information. And all of a sudden, organizations have got money to spend on it. And the reason they got money to spend on it is because of what happened at Optus, what happened at Medibank, et cetera. Yeah, everyone knows. Um, and so all of a sudden we're inundated with uh, the requirement in our customers to help them identify all their personal identifiable information. And there's a lot of AI out there um, you know, historically, that's been used to aid in that. I think uh, where we're doing some stuff which is a bit special is in images. 
So if you've got millions of images in the organization, to actually identify whether those images have PII in them or not is, is quite difficult. Yeah? So that's one area. But that's probably one of the, the only areas we've been able to find other than you know, the summarization, which has little business value at the end of the day in, in, in um, large corporate, um, where we're, we've been able to you know, apply it. I, I think where you're going to be able to apply moving forward, the key is, is integration. So not trying to invent the wheel again, yeah, he's actually looking at, okay, what, what, where can I actually bring two ideas together using that AI? But to your original question, there's, there's not a lot of investment in it in, in the large corporates. They've got little pockets of it. Everyone's excited about it, but they're, they're struggling to get those benefits. So if you can find those benefits and, and help find those benefits, that's where you'll succeed. Yeah, yeah. so that's... Uh that goes back to this group, right? Uh, there is indeed a lot of uh, promise, but there is also a lot of hype. We really need to watch that hype, right? Um, I think AI, for those of you in computer science, you know, if you've read the history, there's was like two so-called winters of AI, right? One in the whatever 1960s and then another one in the 1980s. Uh, currently what we see, and maybe every generation said that, <laughs> is that we have got a real promise. You know, certainly it's been, it's been uh, you know, mind-blowing the, 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 the success on this generative uh, AI, particularly in natural language, but also in images. So we really got to watch that hype so that we don't create so many disappointments by riding on the hype with inappropriate solutions that that you know there is a um, you know there is a shrinking of the market and we lose the opportunity <laughs> along with it. So that's really important that we make sure that we are developing those solutions in the right way, uh, and that that hype actually turns into real opportunities. Right? Okay. More questions. Look one. Just have a sorry. I just have a follow up questions for Damien. So you just mentioned like current challenge is we uh, don't have enough like um uh, use cases for um organizations to justify their investment in AI applications. So I would like to know if there's a different interpretation for organizations for transparency. So when they like interact with um, some AI integrated ERM platforms, um, is it because they didn't provide enough information or any like kind of tra transparency like we can measure for them so that uh, organizations can know more about that and to make justific justifications for that? Um, I, think, I think what it comes down to is, is being able to have a business case to spend, spend money on it. Yeah, and so it's not necessarily that there isn't transparency or yeah, there isn't a, a, a good idea there, but it's how do you actually, like in any organization, you've got to get a business case up to spend money on it. Yeah? And, and you've got to be able to prove the business benefits. And whilst you might be able to get those business benefits, are they real tangible benefits that, that justify the spend? And so usually where we see the spend is with CIOs have got a bit of you know, budget they can throw around and they're really excited by it. Um, but through, through the process, they don't actually get to the point where they're able to prove the business benefits. It's nothing about you know, the fact that they haven't um, been able to be transparent with the, the, the AI that they're using, or you know, I, I think it's more around the business benefits and proving those. It's mm -hmm. yeah, so, so actually, do we, um, because I know like from the previous session, we define transparency in the AI community. We define like we can produce explanations with the uh, result produced by AI systems. But as you just said, is that uh, providing um, like um, suitable use cases for organizations for using their AI products can be considered as a uh, evaluation like metrics for being transparent when they are selling their AI products? I'm not sure if I'm getting the question. Does anybody else want to yeah, jump in? Yeah, because I think we have like different interpretations of yep. transparency, mm -hmm. especially within the organizations. Yeah, in terms of making the business case, you know, if explainability or transparency was a key feature of the solution, would would that help in making that business case better? That's if that's I understood your question. Yeah, anybody is welcome. Actually, it is exactly that, right? Transparency. 
a big problem with transparency it's, like, it's exactly it might mean a lot of things right mm -hmm. and i feel like it is another thing we try my part of my role here is trying to help stakeholders to understand that and it starts first by understanding what do we want by transparency right right for example transparency might have be related to different goals we might talking about compliance with law we might talk about to causability uh, or causality with legal terms. We need to understand what causes harm. We might talking about providing well-informed decisions to clients, right? We, we might talk about uh, I don't know providing further understanding of why using AI or how we we use our personal data, right? And I feel like uh, depending on your goal as an, an organization. There are different ways to uh, implement that, right? A gap in most of the cases I feel in terms of academia and industry is exactly that. Usually, uh, uh, many of the research is observed in terms of transparency and explainability don't make very clear to our organization what is the uh, gain and what is the specific purpose we're talking about here. And usually stakeholders don't see the value of that. And for that reason, that one possible reason of not implementing transparency as academia is proposing, or having lack of transparency, right? Or different ways of bringing transparency. I feel like it is an actual opportunity to uh, sit together and make a, a, a really more effective and, and uh, clear way to map in between what academia wants to transparency, what the value for business, and how to implement each of these uh, specific cases. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Damien and Fernando. Uh, my question is, based on my observation, the companies are usually all the way in to LLMs like Microsoft or Canva, Google or very hesitant to start using them. So uh, I wonder why the reason for those who don't want to use them other than privacy issues and how are things going to converge in the foreseeable future? I can start this time, just uh, the symmetry. Um, so I think the problem with using LMs in production or any sort of environment is evaluation. Like ultimately, it's very difficult to know if the answer you got is correct. Like for that, you need someone to look at it more often than not and tell you. But then that's quite slow and it doesn't really scale. So if you want to release some product to millions and millions of users for them to use it every day, and you know, in 99% of cases, it works really flawlessly, but in 1% it's a disaster. When, once you've released it to a billion people, it's a disaster. So you really want to be confident but evaluation of LLMs right now doesn't scale. You can outsource it to some company and they'll have tens of thousands of people look, or like, you know, tens of thousands of data points will be looked at by people, but that also doesn't scale, which is why they're sort of reluctant to actually incorporate it to every single product. Now, some products, of course, again, allow for hallucinations. They allow for creativity, we can call it. Uh, it's a bit of a euphemism, really, but still. And in those products, of course, you can release it because there's no risk. If it hallucinates, you say, oh, it's just too creative, isn't it? Uh, but in others, uh, you value you know, fidelity. And there, it's quite tough to evaluate. Like, it's, it's a big deal. Like, if you can come up with a way to evaluate outputs of large language models in different contexts, so it's for them to scale, apply. Uh, <laughs> I, I completely agree. I think it's, uh, this also goes to, to Damien's point earlier as well. There are certain applications which can make use of creativity, as, as Victor puts it. Um, but the point at which you switch over to needing clarity um, and fidelity, it, the ability to apply these models, which are fundamentally next word predictors, um, become less and less clear. Um, and it's not that you know they haven't been tried, that they haven't been investigated. Um, it's that. You know, they, they may have been explored and um, uh, found lacking or wanting. And that there are better existing models, you know, other tools in the toolkit that just have a, a better utility um, to that particular problem space. Um, if you consider, you know, Google itself as a product, you know, there's a reason that they haven't switched from Google search to Bard search. There's still a level of not quite there yetness 
um, with even companies that work on this as a full-time job. I'm a first-year PhD researcher, basically AI researcher. So my question is, um, uh, so being an AI researcher in university and then being an AI researcher in industry, how different is it? And what additional skills do we need to, de do we need to develop once we transition from university to industry, especially a researcher field? Um, so I think one thing to understand about research, for example, at zero, and the majority of companies, I would say, is that it's fundamentally applied. So what it means is that you are unlikely to develop new algorithmic adva advances, you know, pushing the frontier. You're more likely to take some off-the-shelf solutions and modify them somehow to fit the context, but it's more or less applied. So you, you know the landscape, you pick the right tool for the job, and you're more focused on the domain you work in, you know, careful evaluation and things like this, rather than something more fundamental. So I would say that's a difference. Like, obviously, exceptions do exist. Like, you can go and work for Google Research or DeepMind or whatever, and you'll be doing low-level algorithmic uh, work, but by and large, that's probably true. So that's the, the main difference. Um, another difference is, well, there is a bit of an 80-20 thing, you know, it's, uh, there are some solutions which are sort of good enough, and in industry, there is time pressures, there is, you know, the necessity to release and things like this. If it's good enough, sometimes you release it. Uh, if you're an academic and, you know, doing research in, in academia, well, you sort of want it to be perfect usually. So that's some, uh, that's one skill that a lot of people probably lack because they're perfectionists at the very core, sort of by construction. And that's perfectly fine in academia, but an industry may cause you problems. So Carl and I are applied scientists. So we don't, like, we do some engineering work, of course. I mean, you code all the time, and that's what you do. But uh, you come up with experiments, um, which means that you have some hypothesis as to what you're going to change and why it might work. And, you know, you change one thing at a time, or you attempt to because attribution is important as well, because often we want to understand why it worked. If you change 100 things and it worked, well, you don't really know very much. So, um, so you, have, you apply some critical thinking and scientific acumen to construct experiments and carefully run them. Research engineering is about facilitating that process. So it's more about building pipelines and just um, kind of finding pain points that you may encounter and alleviating those pain. So it's a bit different. Um, Hopefully that was clear. If not, we'll give up. <laughs> Appreciate you know the perfectionism uh, associated with academia, um, but it's also the publishing culture, right? If you don't get it to a level of it's still good enough, like it's not perfect, but that level might be a different, you know. So uh, you don't get published, right? So so to some extent, it is the publishing culture. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, Victor really summarized it very well in terms of the reward of the applied work, uh, you know, and the billions of people that it will get to, you know, I would struggle to find a, uh, the most successful professor with a billion citations. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think we have time for one more question. So it's like uh, when somebody, let's say he's working in the field of artificial intelligence or uh, machine learning, and he starts de developing certain models, he starts to work in this particular area. And uh, he works in this area for three years, and after that he uh, gets a job in Zero uh, or, or some other company. Uh, and he starts, work in the f starts working in the field of accounting. Now in accounting, he starts working on models and something similar. Now, his three years of work, which he actually dedicated for a similar thing, but in a different domain. And here he's working on a similar thing in a different domain. But again, when he switches to the industry, he is actually a starter. He has to learn accounting from the scratch. He has to learn because without knowing the basics of accounting, he cannot perform over there because it's an accounting kind of a company. So how uh, do you think there's a way we can bridge this gap that this three years that this particular person is working, he directly, when he jumps to the industry, he jumps as a contributor rather than, you know, as a scratch, as a base line where he starts to learn? I guess the way I'd frame that is that when you complete your PhD, you are perfect for one job. Unfortunately, your supervisor has that job and they're not going to give it up. <laughs> So, so what you've gained during your PhD is fundamentally research training. Like it's, it's very much you've you've gained the knowledge to to cre think critically about a problem. 
and that particular skill set does not change. Like that is something that is required wherever you go. Um, sort of throughout the evolution of my career, I've worked in advertising, e-commerce, and now accounting software. Um, and yes, absolutely, there is an onboarding stage where you, you need to discover the problem space, work out a bit of context. But fundamentally, in each of these situations, you're applying the knowledge that you have gained on critical thinking during your PhD and saying, okay, what is the problem I'm trying to solve? Like, I might not know how to, you know, account code reconcile to the Australian taxation standard, um, and I probably never need to know that. But fundamentally, if I can work out what the problem I'm trying to solve for the, the person that needs it solved, I can put in place a methodology to approach that problem. And that is kind of the critical thing that you will bring um, to industry. What a, what a wonderful end to this panel is like, what's the value of a PhD, right? Problem solvers and critical thinkers, right? Yeah, I've done that. Uh, I, myself, uh, uh, I was an example of that, right? I used to be a professor in, in recommended systems in completely different area, and I just jumped to this recruitment area, and I didn't know anything about that at the moment, right? And the first thing to, uh, to make it clear is like, no one is expecting that you will, in a couple of weeks, you will be so all the problems, okay? Don't worry, because they pretty much understand that's really important, that domain uh, knowledge of that. So usually organizations are aware of that and take, uh, give your time to understand and get the proper uh, knowledge about that. And a second point, practical way that usually is a good starting point is like when you get in this situation, uh, as a researcher, you know, the, the good start point is starting by doing, running some data characterization analysis that the best way to know the domain, get in contact with data, the real problems, and be able to do the right questions, right? I feel like the value of, for me at least, the value of a PhD inside organizations is much more long term and the people who are able to guide teams on the right solutions, right? Not the short sprint things that we should do faster. There are no shortcuts in life. <laughs> yes. um, any last minute thoughts uh, from, from anyone? Uh, words of wisdom and inspirational statement. Damien. Throw one out there. Just extending these guys, you know, problem solving is number one. If you're a good problem solver, you can move to any job. It doesn't matter what that job is, yeah? Um, and then I think any experience is, is good experience and you can apply that. I think just, you know, reiterating what these guys have said, you know, that's what it comes down to. So if you've got three years experience over here, which is unrelated, it is related in some way, you're going to be able to apply what you've learned. Yeah. I think that's what we look for when we're trying to get on new people, for sure. Yeah, I totally agree with uh, Damien and uh, Victor. <laughs> but also communication is also important. Um, when we, as a researchers, we um, tend to, you know, hold on that problem, be nervous about uh, any people. I haven't made progress. <laughs> I, I have an issue, but in, in uh, my environment or probably industry is better to communicate your issues early. Everyone understands, you know, probably have the same issue you are having. So able to communicate early, communicate widely, don't hold on, you know, to the last minute you are not able to deliver. At that time you are in serious trouble. So <laughs> uh, communication skills is good to develop. That's my point. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panel for taking the time. Thank you.